right now, especially because the Wi-Fi is a little weird, so I'm just recording um, through my computer, and then I'll post that as well. Um, but anything that we do not get covered in class, all of these slides and my work are on um, Google Classroom, class website, lesson plans. So this is going to be covering chapter four. We're going to focus a lot on net ionic equations and um, solution stoic. So I'm going to try to get us to a limiting reactive problem as well. So what to review, um, you can just kind of skim through chapter four. The first part of 4.4 is oxidation reduction reaction. You can ignore that. Look over any particle diagrams in chapter four. So there are some examples, molarity, comparing solutions, um, also give you the sections in the book. If you need a textbook, so I told the class yesterday this, if you need a textbook, I'll open the cabinet so you can see where it is. You can feel free when the bell rings to just grab one on your way out. Don't worry, I mean, the, the seniors were returning their books, so I left the slips inside. But you can just grab one, throw any papers that are inside away, and then you have one. So, if we, this isn't even the right computer. <laughs> yeah, they're brand new markers. They're excellent. So, solubility rules. The only solubility rules that you guys need to know are potassium, nitrate, ammonium, and sodium. If it does not have potassium, nitrate, ammonium, or sodium, you assume it's insoluble. If it has one of those four, then you assume it's soluble. Right? That's it. Those are the only solubility rules you need to know. When it comes to looking at net ionic equations, so we're going to actually look at, at writing complete ionic, net ionic equations, you have to know the difference between a strong electrolyte and a weak electrolyte. So an electrolyte is just an aqueous solution that has ions. That's kind of the general definition of an electrolyte. And then you have strong and weak electrolytes. So a strong electrolyte is something that exists in, sol in solution completely as ions. So strong electrolytes, you have one of three things. You have an ionic, an insoluble ionic compound. So that is something that is composed of a metal and a non-metal that is aqueous. Notice that solution means all of these are aqueous. If it is a solid, a liquid, or a gas, it's not an electrolyte at all. But a soluble ionic substance is a strong electrolyte, strong acids, and strong bases. Now you do need to know your strong acids and strong bases. So, see if I can do this. So strong acids. Seven strong acids, HCl, HBr, HI. So those are the binary acids, meaning it's hydrogen and one anion, or one nonmetal. Then we have HNO3, H2SO4, HClO3, HClO4. Seven strong acids. So HCl, HBr, HI, HNO3, H2SO4, HClO3, HClO4. And then yesterday, when we went through post lab questions, I showed you guys the strong bases. So the trick to remember the strong bases, and it makes the lowercase b on the periodic table. So lithium down, calcium down, it makes that lowercase b. Any of those um, metals with hydroxide is a strong base. LiOH, NaOH, KOH, that's how you can tell. So lithium down, calcium down. A weak electrolyte um, is something that exists mostly as molecules. So a weak electrolyte does not break apart into its ions in solution. A weak electrolyte is a weak acid, a weak base. So something like acetic acid, that's vinegar. That's a weak acid. It does not break apart, it stays together. So when it comes to looking at net ionic equations, we have to be able to, to distinguish the difference between strong electrolytes 
and weak electrolytes. Well, this multiple choice question will probably be a little easier. All right, there are seven strong acids, which is not a strong acid. But this is a very good question because this, this acid specifically is very commonly mistaken as a strong acid because it's in the same family. HF is not a strong acid. HF is a weak acid. It stays together as HF when it's in solution. Strong acids, 100% ionized. So now we're going to jump into net ionic equations. Probably one of the most important things to review. So we have three different types of equations. We have the molecular equation. Molecular equation is when you write something like H2 plus O2 yields H2O. That's a molecular equation. Gives the overall reaction. Complete ionic equation. Complete ionic equation is when we break apart strong electrolytes. So it gives the equation including all of the ions that are in solution. So complete ionic, we've taken apart the strong electrolytes. Net ionic is when we only include what is actually undergoing a chemical change. Net ionic, we have taken out spectator ions. So net ionic equations, there are no spectator ions in it. It's showing just the chemistry, just the chemistry that's occurring. However, you do want to always make sure that it is still balanced. So don't forget to, to make sure that coefficients go where they need to go, You're taking into account subscripts. And again, these slides are on the website, so if you do need them. So now we're going to get into an example, um, and this deals with spectator ions. So remember that spectator ions are those that are in solution but do not react. So they just stay in solution and they watch the reaction occur. And so this is identify any spectator ions for the reaction of sodium phosphate solution with calcium nitrate solution. All right, so um, you can start by taking words and going to symbols. So sodium phosphate, sodium is Na, phosphate is PO4, but remember when you write a new Compound, when you write the formula, you have to take into account charges. Sodium carries a plus one charge. What charge does phosphate carry? Three minus, or a minus three. So sodium phosphate is Na3PO4. And the reason I know it's aqueous is because it says solution. It tells us. And calcium nitrate. Calcium nitrate. Ea is 2 plus. And the 3 is minus 1 or 1 minus or minus. So there's our reactants. So now we have to actually figure out products before we can do anything else. So it's a double replacement reaction. Na is going to combine with NO3. Ca is going to combine with PO4. So there's Ca3, PO4, 2. So again, you always have to check the charges. Double check. Now, I need to make sure that I'm writing states of matter because I need to know what is aqueous and what is not. The only solubility rules you have to know, potassium, nitrate, ammonium, and sodium. Is NaNO3 soluble? Yes, it has both Na and NO3. Soluble means it's aqueous. Does calcium phosphate have potassium, nitrate, ammonium, or sodium in it? No, so it's insoluble. It is a solid. That is our molecular equation. Now we do want to make sure that we balance it. So before we do anything else, we should balance it so we keep our coefficients. So three column. Two, two, three. There we go. All right, so 
2361. That's our molecular equation. Now, after molecular, we go to complete ionic. Complete ionic is when we break apart strong electrolytes. So strong electrolytes, an electrolyte first, can only be an aqueous solution. So solids, I'm going to just put an X under here because a solid, a liquid, or a gas does not even have the potential to break apart. So now we need to think about each of these. So this is these three are aqueous. If it is ionic, a strong acid or a strong base, it'll break apart. All three of these are ionic. How do I know that something is ionic? What does it usually include? Metal and non-metal, non right? Or metal and polyatomic. So this is ionic, this breaks apart. Breaks apart, breaks apart. So I just use the arrows and the X's just so that I can remember. So when it breaks apart, I'm going to split it into its ions. Now we have to take into account coefficients and subscripts. So we need to make sure we know how many of each we have. So based on the coefficient of the two and the subscript of the three, how many NAs do we actually have here? Six. So we have six Na plus. plus 2 PO4 3 minus plus 3 Ca2 plus plus 6 NO3 minus yields 6 Na plus plus 6 NO3 minus Plus, and then this solid stays together. Ca3, PO4, 2, solid. Notice the only ions, the only thing that can have a charge is anything that is an aqueous solution. Solids, liquids, and gases you should never write with charges. So this is the complete ionic equation. This shows everything. Now, we have to cancel out spectator ions. They are called spectator ions for a reason. They have to be an ion, a charged particle, and they have to be the exact same on both sides. So what is one spectator ion? As we look at this. Either one. Six Na plus. Right, six Na plus. There's no way I'm gonna, the only reason I know names I would never know. Yeah. Six and a three minus. Six and a three minus. So those are the exact same. Now I always have a question, could I have like six and four? Yeah, you could, and they cancel out four of them, but usually they're going to cancel out completely. So spectator ions are the exact same on both sides. Those cancel out. Now I'm left with my net ionic equation. So my net is showing the actual chemistry that's occurring. So aqueous, 3 Ca2 plus, Ca3. And notice that it still is balanced. There's still 3 Ca's, 2 PO4's. So there's our net ion. Um, any questions on identifying spectators, grouping three net ionic equations? No? All right. Yeah, let's, so yeah, see how uh, these tissues work to erase. Oh, man, no? Yeah, okay, here we go. And of course, like I actually left my whiteboard spray at home, so it's fine. Normally I'll have whiteboard spray. Yeah, 
And that'll be fine. For now, maybe. For now. Anyone else? Well, we'll, uh, You're we'll, we'll leave this in a second. Kind of. Um, yeah. So I'm going to kind of skip through because these are just more net ionic, complete ionic. So if you think that you need more help with these, you can go through and you can you can work through the um, the slides. So now I want to move on to dilutions. So dilutions are still part of solution story, um, and dilutions use one of the probably most most used equations in chemistry. Not necessarily like in class, but like in a lab, dilutions are used the most. And so this is what volume of 10 molar NaOH must be used to prepare 500 milliliters of a 1.5 molar solution. So when you have what's called a stock solution, so typically it's a higher concentration solution, and you are changing the concentration, it is the same substance. This is still NaOH. I'm just going from 10 molar NaOH down to 1.5 molar NaOH. I'm going to use the dilution formula. M1V1 equals M2V2. I use this when I prep solutions for every lab. So M, capital M is molarity, V is volume. As long as your volumes are in the same unit, you do not have to convert. But you do need to make sure that everything goes together. So what volume of 10 molar? It also doesn't matter which one you pick as one or two. I'm just going to say this is M1. This unknown volume goes with V1. 500 milliliters, there's a volume. That goes with 1.5 molar. So we have M1. Molar. V1, I don't know. M2, 1.5 molar. V2, 500 milliliters. So 1.5 times 500. Again, you can keep it. You can keep it in milliliters. It doesn't specify. I'm going to solve for V1. So to solve for V1, I'm going to divide by 10. I'm just including the units here so that you can see how my units cancel. So 1.5 times 500 divided by 10. And those of you that have a calculator, what do you get for V1? 75. If we want to keep it to three sig figs, it is 75.0. Because 1.5 times 500, and then make sure you divide that by 10. So you get 75.0 milliliters. That's it for dilutions. If you have like 0 0.0, like 1, 2, 3, is that zero common now? Yes. It does. Wait. Okay. Add the sig fig? Like if you have like 0.0, 1, 2, Oh, no, no, no. No, it no, doesn't I count. thought you had like 75.0. No, 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 no. No, no. this is not okay. significant. Okay. No. Um, leading zeros are never significant. Trailing are only significant if they're decimals. Okay. Yeah. I walked by and saw Sean from the YouTube page yesterday. Oh. <laughs> um, so 75.0 milliliters is, is our volume. Um, if you notice that it's the same substance and you're just changing the concentration, that is a dilution. If it is, um, if it's two different substances, that's not a dilution, that's going to be stoic. So, let's get into stoic. This is going to be useful because we didn't get to limiting reactants yesterday. This lets us actually combine stoic with limiting reactants with solutions. So if 1.46 grams of magnesium 
are added to 500 milliliters of a 0.2 molar solution of copper 2 sulfate. What is the maximum amount of H2 that can be formed? Now, if you notice, you have a balanced equation already. If you have coefficients, I'm not going to trick you and give you coefficients and then say, like, aha, it wasn't balanced. No, if you have coefficients, it's balanced. So since we see the coefficients, we assume it's balanced. Now, here's how we tell that we have to determine the limiting reactant. I am given a starting amount for magnesium, and I am given starting amounts of CuSO4. When you are given starting amounts of more than one reactant, you have to figure out which one is limiting. So you have to figure out which one's going to be the limiting reactant because the limiting reactant limits the reaction. Do we run out of it first? Now I'm going to read ahead and it says, what's the maximum amount of H2 that can be formed? So when I do my limiting reactant problem, I'm just going to stoic directly to H2. So kind of killing two birds with one stone. So I'm going to start with 1.46 grams of magnesium. So I'm going to start with magnesium and I'm going to see, is magnesium my limiting reactant? So I'm starting with grams. If in doubt, go to moles. But always start your stoic by converting your given information to moles. So I'm going to go grams of mg to moles of mg. Uh, from the periodic table, molar mass of magnesium is 24.3 grams. Grams cancel, I'm at moles. Now I need to go from magnesium to hydrogen because the problem is asking information about H2. So I'm going to use the balanced equation. For every two moles of magnesium, I make one mole of H2 gas. And then when it asks about an amount, it's talking about mass. So one mole of H2, now be careful because this is H2 gas. So instead of being just one hydrogen, it's two. Your molar mass would be 2.016 grams. So, So based on the amount of magnesium, we would produce 0 0.0606 grams of H2. Now we need to do the same thing, but with copper 2 sulfate. Now we're not just given grams of copper 2 sulfate. We're given a volume and a molarity. Molarity is just a way for us to go between moles and liters. Molarity is a conversion factor that we can use. So I'm going to start with the given volume, 500 milliliters of CuSO4. So molarity is a conversion factor between moles and liters. So I need to start. I need to start by going to liters. Now I always have the question, like if I know, if I look at this and I can say this is just 0.5, Liters. Can I just write that down? Yeah, that's fine. So, molarity allows us to go between liters of solution and moles of the solute. 
molarity is always moles per liter. So if it's 8.2 molar solution, it's 0.2 moles in one liter. So it's another way for us to convert our given information to moles. And I also have other people that will ask, like, can I do this calculation separately off to the side and solve for moles and then start with moles of CUSO4? Yes, that's fine as well. There are different ways that you could solve a problem and still come up with the same answer. So moles of CUSO4, now I want to go to H2. So for every two moles of CUSO4, one mole of H2. And for every one mole of H2, it's 2.016 grams. Again, it's 2.016 because it is H2 gas. So 500 times 0.2. So 0 0.101 grams of H2. So what we just did is we just determined, right, and if you left this out to like 4, 6, 8, that's fine. What we just determined is first, if all of the magnesium was used, here's how much hydrogen we would make. Then we looked, we said if all of the 500 milliliters of 0.2 molar solution was used, here's how much hydrogen we'd make. The limiting reactant is the one that makes the least amount of product because it runs out first. So in, the, in the, the case of these, which is limiting, magnesium or CUSO4? Magnesium, which means there's our answer. So again, what we did here if we did limiting reactants, and we looked at some solution stoic. So just know that volume and molarity allows you to find moles. Questions on this example? Yes. Wouldn't the answer be the other one if you just did the maximum amount? Well, but the maximum amount is only based on the limiting reactant. So like we can't we can't make this much because we still only have this much magnesium reacting. So like maximum amount in this case means when our limiting reactant is completely used up, what is the amount of H2? Yeah. Yeah, because if so if we were to make this much H2, we would actually need more than 1.46 grams of magnesium. Yep. Okay. Um, so, so this is a little bit longer of one, but this is looking at particle diagrams. Um, if we don't get through the whole thing, that's okay. Um, but this is asking us to look at two different solutions. So this is that two solutions are prepared. One, copper two nitrate, one of KOH. Draw a molecular representation of the two solutions. I'm assuming the be that beaker one contains four formula units of Cu1032, which just means we have four of these. And the other beaker contains six KOHs. So, So, again, it says that we have C103, and it said in this beaker, we have four of these formula units. Formula units is just um, the, the proper term for a molecule of an ionic compound. And then we have another beaker that's KOH, and we have six. KOHs. So, 
We're drawing these in two separate containers. Now, they're both solutions, which means they're aqueous. Here's what we should think about. If this is aqueous, we want to think, will it break apart completely into its ions? If it's ionic, if it's strong acid or a strong base, it will break apart. So this is ionic. It's going to break apart into its ions. So I'm just going to make a note here. It's going to break apart into Cu2 plus and two NO3 minuses. So every single CuNO32 that we have is going to break apart into this. So let's make my attempt at a beaker. That's pretty good. So if I have four CuNO32s, that means I'm going to have four Cu2 pluses and eight NO3 minuses. Now I'm going to just draw a little like key over here. I'm going to make a filled in circle CO2 plus. I'm going to make an open circle and a three lines. I'm not worried about the Lewis structure, what any of this looks like. Right now what we're focusing on is what happens in solution. So I have four CO2 pluses and I have eight There's our CU1032. We have four of them. Then it says that we have the other beaker that has KOH. Right? Here. Pretend those are the same size and not crooked. KOH. It says it's a solution and it's ionic. That's K plus the metal. So each KOH is going to break apart into K plus and OH minus. Now because we're going to be doing things which we might be looking at these separately, I'm going to do squares now. Filled in square is K plus, and open square is OH minus. So if I have six KOHs, that means I'm going to have six K pluses and six OH minuses. One. Two, three, four. It doesn't really matter where in the beaker you put them. But there are six. And then six OH minuses. One, two, three. And they should be separated. So we took these solutions, which are strong electrolytes, and we split them up. Now I'm just going to keep reading from this slide. I'll read you the next part. So it says, draw a molecular representation of the solution that results when the contents of the beaker are mixed. Include the correct number and the correct number of ions remaining. So if we're focusing on what happens when they're mixed, we need to look at the balance equation. So let's look at what happens when we put these together. So, double replacement reaction, we get K plus NO3 minus, which is KNO3, CU2 plus, OH minus, COH2. Remember when you write, you compound, you formula, you have to take into account charges. Now let's look at states of matter here. Is KNO3 soluble? Yes, it has potassium and nitrate in it. Is copper 2 hydroxide soluble? No, it doesn't have potassium, nitrate, aluminum, or sodium in it. So, let's make sure it's balanced 2 and 2. Now, here is really what we're looking at here. It's just like we did in the do now. So, in the do now, we looked at this and we said, okay, one CuNO32 needs two KOHs. So I'm going to do that up here. One CuNO32 
needs two KOHs. And that's going to produce two KNO3s, so that would be A and a 3. I split this up because it's aqueous. A and a 3. And one CuOH2. Now this is a solid. I'm going to put it together. So if we're thinking about what this would look like in a beaker, the solid will go down here at the bottom. So now we're going to do it again. So one C103, two. And then we do it again, so we produce and one solid, and then we can do it one more time. I'm going to do that so I can circle two. Here we go, one more time. So one C one three two, and I have one two KOHs. So then I would produce this one more time, and then one more solid. Now, can I do this reaction again looking at the reactants? No. Why? Not enough KOH. KOH is not limiting reacting here. But I still have some excess here. So when I put this all into a beaker, I put my solid at the bottom, three solids at the bottom, and then I put my ions up here. I need to make sure to include one Cu2 plus and two NO3 minuses because those are my excess. So that kind of tied in like particle diagrams and net ionics, um, complete ionics. So that was actually one of the last slides. So as you're looking through everything, if you have other questions,